Welcome to our Wednesday night prayer meeting. We're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7 tonight. And I hope you will take the time to pray after my devotional tonight. And that we will continue to pray for our country, both economically and, and for the end of the coronavirus. It's been a very difficult time. And one of the best things that we can do is to pray the scripture together. I've been posting uh, a few different requests on our Facebook account on the church. Uh, so I thought I would be, begin and end with uh, two of the posts um, this evening. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you would bless us, that you would make your face shine on us, and be gracious to us as families, as a church here, and even as a nation. Look with favor on us and give us peace. Help us, Lord, to trust you in all that we're going through. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we began with the concept of the Lord being near. And we, we were talking about the disunity that existed between Yodia and Syntyche. The Lord is near and our moderation needs to be made known to all men. The idea of a sense of gentleness, knowing that God is in control not trying to wrest that control back or live in a in such a way where we're swinging between extremes. Uh, so that that kind of leads into verses 6 and 7 this evening. The Lord is near, uh, therefore he will hear our prayer and then bring us peace. So prayer becomes the central theme of verses 6 and 7 of Philippians 4. There Paul writes, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now Paul utilizes three expressions for prayer in verses 6 and 7. And I think he does that to emphasize the importance of prayer. So it becomes very important for us to persist in our prayer effort before the Lord, uh, even when we're apart for this short time. We need believing, expectant prayer in order to see God work in great and mighty ways. Psalm 81.10 is a favorite verse of mine. Open, the, open your mouth wide and the Lord shall fill it. In, in this case, we open up our mouth wide in prayer and we believe that the Lord will uh, bring good things into our lives. It's our responsibility to pray and then God's responsibility to answer. He will hear and answer prayer. So since this is true, we shouldn't be anxious about anything. We shouldn't worry as a church. We gather in prayer and we experience peace regar regardless of the circumstances that we're going through right now. God produces peace in our hearts. The text says that we should be anxious for nothing, first of all. That's the, that's the first thought that I want us to dwell on here in this passage. Don't worry about anything, Paul is saying. There's a difference between good concern and bad worry in the text. It's good for me to be concerned about our church's welfare, for example, as its pastor. It, it's bad for me, though, to worry hopelessly and feel stress and anxiety over things that are happening in the world around me or even in the, in the church that the Lord has placed me. It's not that we don't have anything to be concerned about or even to worry about in the world. We do. Uh, but, but, but that concern needs to be articulated to God. We, we, can't, we can't keep it inside and worry about it. There's a difference between casting your burden upon the Lord and then holding on to it yourself. And I think that that's what we see here in verses 6 and 7. I, can, I don't have to be anxious because the Lord is near to hear our prayer and he will bring us peace. You say, well, are you concerned about the coronavirus? Well, I think all of us are to varying degrees. But, but we are not weighed down as Christians with worry about anything. No matter how bad we think the coronavirus is or how bad it isn't. All right, that's not the point. The point is, is that we know that the Lord is near and he will hear our prayer and bring us peace. 
He articulates this with three words, prayer, supplication, and requests. In everything by prayer and supplication, make those requests known to God. And the alternative to that is worry. So, I would rather pray about everything and at all times. We are never anxious, but always prayerful as believers. And, and this is the same comprehensive emphasis that we saw in verses 3 and 4 in Philippians chapter 1. There, Paul said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. Always. And every prayer. We pray about all things. We pray all the time. The Lord wants us to bring him both the small things of life and, and even the great things in life. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. Nothing is too small that escapes his notice. The Lord is always near to hear and answer our prayer and give us peace. But we have to ask the question, well, what is prayer? Well, these three words help us. Synonyms mean essentially the same thing, but, but they offer us different facets. When I think about the word prayer, I, I think about the primary thing that prayer is. Prayer is asking. I'm asking God, I'm pleading, I'm bringing these things to God. I'm asking. Prayer is essentially defined then as asking. When I bring in this idea of supplication, it's still asking, but, 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 but there's an urgency to a supplication. I, I, I am pleading with God to meet a need and to meet it quickly. I am a supplicant before God. And I'm bringing requests. And when I think about requests, when we take prayer requests, they're specific. You know, to, to pray about general things is like nailing jello to the wall. Paul was not general in his prayer, but he honed in and he was specific uh, when it came to the things that he was asking God for. And he didn't presume upon God that those things would be there. He actually articulated that, that he needed these things from God. And we should be the same way. For example, Paul prayed for the salvation of his countrymen. He prayed for the safe delivery of an offering to Jerusalem as he was on his missionary journey. He prayed for purity. He prayed for maturity. He prayed for wisdom. He prayed for spiritual enlightenment, for understanding, for God's power. We make our requests known in the same way that Paul does. We're specific. We have requests for love and for fruit and for knowledge and for boldness and for clarity, for the effective entrance of the gospel for our, for boldness that we need in order to deliver its message for works that are good yes but that are eternally valuable before god as a man of prayer paul then teaches us to pray even as the lord jesus taught us to pray there is no power uh, in us right and, and there is no power in maybe the methodology that we're using to pray or the vocabulary that we have. It's not like we have a, a better, sanctified, more holy vocabulary. The power belongs to God. It is in the one we, in whom we pray to. That's where the power is. And so God is strong and he answers our prayers. We are feeble and, and weak and our faith is as a mustard seed at times, but God, he is powerful to answer our prayer requests. Our circumstances will change, but, but God himself never changes. And he's always there for us. He's able to help us to endure and to find hope, even in the midst of suffering. Make your request known to God, and, and on your behalf, and on my behalf, make those requests known. On the behalf of others in the congregation, make those requests known. In your intercessory prayer effort. Um, Pray that the Lord would heal, that he would protect, that he would deliver us from suffering. Pray for the world. Pray for other churches. Pray for other believers. Pray for that believer you don't agree with on Facebook or Twitter. Pray for Christian growth. Pray for the progress of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Make these requests known to God. And he says, do it with thanksgiving. Uh, attending prayer is the idea of thanksgiving. So our, our gratitude is always directed to God. In our mind, we have that, that idea of thankfulness. We, we, we don't always maybe articulate it explicit, explicitly, but it's there. We express gratitude in our prayers because 
That's our attitude toward God. We're thankful to God. We're thankful to a person. It, it's not a, a nebulous thankfulness that's out there. You know, uh, that's why the concept of, of being thankful to somebody who is a non-believer just seems so foreign to me. Uh, to whom are you thankful? We are thankful to God because of the blessings that he bestows upon us. All right? So if we're truly confident in God's ability, if, if we really believe that God is sovereign and we're not just paying lip service to that concept, then no matter how difficult things are getting in America, we shall, we shall be a grateful people. You see, the foundation of effective prayer, according to the Bible, is grateful people asking, making their requests known, is bringing their supplications before God. And so we can't really worship God or, or, or give our lives in a godly way without this concept of gratitude. We're useless people without gratitude. And so the reality of our lives is that we're going to suffer and struggle in our lives. If we can maintain gratitude through suffering and through struggle, then we're saying to the world, God is still in charge. He is on the throne. He's sovereign over all things. And he shall sustain us. He is near and present with us. And we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And then you have the peace of God in verse 7. And that peace is coming out of our prayer effort in verse 6. Because the, the verse, verse 7, begins with the word and. That connective brings us right to the peace of God. God produces peace and he does so through the avenue of grateful prayer. And it's peace that surpasses all understanding. And it's peace that guards our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You see, if I don't pray, then the result of a prayerless life is stress, and anxiety, and hopelessness. A failure to bring my concerns to God is a failure to be of much use to the people that are around me because there is no intercessory prayer. God may or may not answer me in specific ways, but still, he will bring me peace as I pray. The God of peace produces peace, and he does so in his people. He brings an inner stability. He is the source of peace. The peace comes from prayer, and the kind of peace we're talking about is inward. He is producing an inward peace of heart or, or of mind. We, we say peace of mind. But, it, but it's the relational peace that, that guards us and protects us. It protects our hearts and minds. It's, it's the peace that Jesus talked about in John chapter 14, verse 27, when he said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be tr troubled, neither let it be afraid. This is the peace that is the part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit that we spoke of on Sunday afternoon in Galatians 5 and verse 22. It is something that we are capable of accessing at all times through Christ Jesus and, and through our responsibility to depend upon him in prayer. Colossians 3 and verse 15 says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Don't you want that? I want God's peace to rule in my heart so that uh, I, can, I can be unified with you in this effort. He says, to which also you were called in one body. And then that important component to prayer, be thankful. Isaiah 26, verse 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. This stability, this inward peace that, that God wants us to have is here in Isaiah. And it's a peace that surpasses understanding. What, what, do the, what is the Bible talking about when it talks about peace that surpasses all understanding? Well, I think there's two, two alternatives to this. I think the best way to go is to look at this peace as something that surpasses all human attempts to comprehend it. It's something that's supernatural. It's God that does it so that uh, he helps us to, to work through the anxiety in our lives. It, it, it's, it's a way that in which he protects or, or garrisons us where he, he protects that inward man, that, that, that thinking process that we're going through. See, we are guarded by God. It's God's peace. You know, you say, well, uh, I, 
I think of, of God's peace and it just seems to be elusive to me. I, I think it's elusive because we're trying to go through the valley of the shadow of death, whatever is in that valley, whatever we're fearful of, we're trying to do that alone and in our own power, in our own strength. If we're honest, we're, we're not depending upon God and we're not prayerful. If we will go uh, through the valley of the shadow of death and, and, and depend upon the Lord, we won't fear any evil because God will be there to comfort us, his rod and staff. Prayer connects us with God so that his power enables our hearts and minds to be at peace and to not be anxious. You say, well, what is being guarded? Well, the heart, the mind. You say, well, what does that mean? It's talking about your inner person, that man in the mirror. The heart and mind of a person is a summation of their whole inner being. Who is guarding us on the inside? It, it, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. The, the Spirit of God produces peace in us. And he does so through the work of Christ. That's what it means when it says through Christ Jesus here. So, if we work backwards in chapter 4, we can be free from anxiety, verse 6. To find joy in all situations, verse 4. To enable gentleness you know, that moderation that we talked about last week, to cultivate the right attitudes that lead to unity, verses 2 and 3, and to preserve, or to persevere, rather, as a church, verse 1. So this piece is related to, not just to the things that come before it, but to the things that come after it. When we look at verse 8, uh, next week, Lord willing, we'll see that we have to have a different kind of thinking that's going on inside of us. And so the peace of God will impact our thinking. We will be uh, a better example of the Lord Jesus Christ, even as, as Paul was a better example uh, in prison. So, what good things do you desire? That, that's a question that you might ask yourself as you think of verses 6 and 7. Is your heart set on only what you yourself are able to gain in order to be happy in your life? What, what you're able to physically do or to intellectually um, ascertain in life. You're, you're kind of limiting yourself when you think that way. Is prestige and honor in this world, uh, is that what you're all about? That's severely limiting. An insatiable thirst for possessions here. Pining o over a person uh, or, or, or over a situation or a circumstance in life that you don't have, maybe to be married or to have children. I mean, we see examples of this in the scripture. When we contemplate these questions, the, the proper response is, is this producing anxiety in me, or is this something that I'm articulating to the Lord? It's not sinful for me to want these things, for example, to want a spouse or, or to want children. But, but, but am I willing to subordinate myself to the sovereignty of God in these things? Right? Am, I, am I willing to... Uh, give to what God has uh, what God has allowed in my life, what God has permitted to happen or to unfold in my life. If I'm not, then those good things that I desire, I become preoccupied with them. When I don't have them, it leads really to bitterness. And if it's not the good things that we desire that become a problem, then maybe it's the bad things that we dread. What are some of the bad things that you dread. Do you dread getting coronavirus or cancer or uh, being financially wrecked because of what's happening around us? We dread these things and we don't really believe that God can bring us through these things. And sometimes we dread these things and they never happen. How many things have we worried about that never really occurred? You know, people who live in constant dread about the things that are happening around them, uh, these people are, are sacrificing an eternal quality of life. They're sacrificing hope and peace that they could have. And, and they're not allowing God to use trials to help them to endure, to persist in prayer, and to uh, really uh, better their relationship with God. So we're sequestered in our homes, and, and we are this way in order to uh, avoid a virus that is sweeping through the world. We need to understand that, that 
it's either, you know, we do this and it drives us to God or, or we do this and it drives us crazy or frustrated or whatever. And, and I opt for depending upon God and his wisdom in all of this. And then finally, what trouble are you experiencing? I mean, is it a heavy thing that you're going through right now? Is it, is it part of an accumulation of trouble or, or a trial? Is it a physical illness? Is it uh, some embarrassment in life? Is it grief? Or are you giving yourself over to depression or, or disillusionment? Is there something that's impossible in your life or inaccessible? You're just frustrated about it. Do you want to run away from it all? Or are you so distressed about things in life that you're even contemplating suicide? See, th this happens to, to even believers. We grieve over our circumstances and and, and it's not wrong to grieve. Jesus wept, right? Don't get me wrong, John chapter 11. But, but he knew that the glory of God was the end of all of the weeping. Weeping might endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You know, when Jesus prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me, he also prayed, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. The Lord will produce peace in us from the inside out. He's going to protect us. He's going to help us. So, the trouble we're experiencing, God can see us through. I trust that these verses will be a blessing to you. Remember, prayer is the antidote to anxiety. Prayer with thanksgiving. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. and Maybe not in person, but to, to be able to uh, come together around your word so that we might pray more effectively. Uh, Lord, we will cast our burden on you, and then we know you will sustain us. You will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Strengthen us in our inward man so that we don't fear or flee or so that we're not anxious about things. Direct us so that we might know the head of, way ahead of us. And help us, Lord, to stay the course. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.